All righty, church. Well, I hope we're excited to dive into the Bible. Yeah. Not just come together and get to give each other high fives <laughs> and spend time, which is so great. But for us to be strengthened and inspired and convicted by God's Word. Come on, and it's amazing that we get to worship God. Yeah. That we get to worship Jesus, the Son of God, yeah. who is the King of Kings yes. and the Lord of Lords. Yeah. And I don't know about you, if I was to meet somebody from the royal family, right, be from England or wherever, isn't there kind of like, like an awe? Absolutely. Uh, what am I doing here? I mean, right? you'd probably never see them just hanging out in Starbucks. <laughs> right? So, wow, that, that's that's the queen of England. And she's drinking... That's not tea. Is that a pumpkin spice latte? And she's still, you know, I don't know if you can watch it. But she's like, hello, how's it going? Right? That probably wouldn't happen. Why? Because there's not a commonality. When we think that we have things in common, we don't think about the king or queen of a nation. Yeah. And yet with Jesus, What's so powerful is we have a king who has everything in common with us. Isn't that powerful? And so the title of our lesson this morning, as we dive into the scriptures, is simply a king with a common touch. We worship a God, a king with a common touch. Look over in Hebrews chapter 4. This is going to help us understand Jesus a little bit better. Why? I know, I know for myself, oftentimes I can feel like Jesus is the king of a nation that I, I can't touch. I can't approach. I can't be cl close to. I can't relate. The only thing I might have in common with Jesus at times is that he probably had a beard and I have a beard. <laughs> and yet the Bible tells us here in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 14. It says, therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven... Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are. Yet he did not sin. Verse 16. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of meeting in church. Amen. The Bible says right here, Jesus is our high priest. What does that even mean? See, in the old covenant, with God's people and God, there was to be a sacrifice, a shedding of blood to atone for their sins. And only the high priest, once a year, could enter the presence of God to offer that sacrifice. And yet the Bible says here, Jesus is our high priest. That Jesus intercedes, he goes on our behalf, and his blood being shed brings atonement at one with God. We can be at one with God because of Jesus Christ. And so when he enters the presence of God, he helps us to have a relationship so we can find mercy and we can have true grace. Isn't that powerful? Yeah, yeah. And yet here it doesn't say that Jesus, the extraordinary who you have nothing in common with, you can never fathom. You can never comprehend. You can never be anywhere near or like at all. It says instead, he had every temptation just like us, yet he did not sin. See, Jesus went through, therefore he has empathy. It's not sympathy, but oh, I feel so sorry for you. I don't know what that's like. He was like, I know exactly what you're feeling. Yeah. You look around the room, we have a lot of different people. Different walks of life, different ages. We came from, from, from different circumstances, challenges and hardships, socioeconomic, whatever it is. And yet the Bible says and declares, Jesus understands you. Jesus knows exactly what you're feeling because he's gone through that too. He's felt those same feelings of hopelessness or shame or doubt or anxiety. Whatever it is. He has endured it. And yet, because of his example, he did not sin. So we've got to have an understanding here as well. I don't know about you. Many times we begin to be tempted with sin. And so we automatically assume that is sin. We're tempted with lustful thoughts. We're tempted with doubt or fear. We're tempted with pride. We're tempted with laziness. We go, well, I've already tempted, so I might as well be lazy. I might as well be anxious. I might as well be impure. 
And yet the Bible says, no, no, no. Temptation is not sin. Jesus was tempted. And yet was without sin. We can relate to him. And he can relate to us. That would be incredible. A king with a common touch. Look over in Luke chapter 4. We're going to quickly look at when Jesus was tempted and yet was without sin. It came with a common touch. Luke chapter 4. It's amazing. We pick up where Jesus has been baptized. Isn't that amazing? Like Jesus can, can totally empathize with what it means to be a baby Christian. <laughs> Jesus can totally empathize with what it means to have to go through the hardships to be baptized. Jesus can totally empathize with all of these things. And then we're going to find out what happens right after he's baptized into Jesus. <laughs> Verse 1. The Bible reads, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days and at the end of them was hungry. Stop here. You know, a king with a common touch. Our first, first point is, if you're going to understand this, you need to know who you are. Know who you are. Jesus is hungry after not eating for 40 days. You guys ever been hungry? Then you can say you understand a little bit what Jesus felt. You're a little bit like Jesus right there. And so we keep reading in verse 4, verse 3. Jesus is hungry, verse 3. The devil said to him, if you are the son of God, Tell this stone to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone. <laughs> Immediately, after Jesus is baptized, the first thing that happens is Satan comes to test him. Satan comes to tempt him. And yet we see there's a paradox. The Bible says that Satan came to tempt him. Yet it was the Spirit of God that led him to that situation. Isn't that incredible. See, God's sovereign in that He either makes things happen or allows things to happen. A lot of times, wow, Satan's really after you. Yes, that's true. But God is allowing that to test your faith. God is allowing that so you can become who He wants you to be and so you can understand and know who you are. Satan doesn't say, hey, man, are you hungry? Hey, are you this? Are you? He doesn't go after these, these like basic need situations. He uses them as leverage when we're weak to get us to question our deeper heart. His question was simple. He's like, hey, if you're really the Son of God. I mean, could you imagine? I can't question Jesus. But when you're weak, when you're tired, when you're overwhelmed, when you understand what you're going to have to do, and he's like, are you really a Christian? Yeah. I mean, are you really going to be pure? I mean, are you, did you really change when you became a disciple? I mean, do you think you're really going to evangelize the world in this generation? Do you think that's possible? I mean, is it really worth it to give up all of this? I mean, is this really who you should be with for the rest of your life? I mean, Satan throws so many existential questions at us. And yet Jesus fought back, not with his superior knowledge of mathematics, right? His incredible understanding of the politics of the time. Instead, he goes, you know what? It is written. The Bible says, the Come word on. of God says he fought back with the scriptures. Yeah, yeah. We're not going to overcome because we're so tall or great or funny or whatever. No, we're going to fight that because we understand God's word. God, God's word overcomes the temptations of Satan. And he says, man should not live on bread alone. But again, you've got to know who you are. What does that mean to know who you are? You are a son and daughter of God. Isn't that cool? Yeah. And so if God is, there we say, he's, of course, the king, then the son or the daughter of a king is a prince, a princess. Isn't that cool to think about? Like when you saw the royal wedding of the, the prince and the princess, you're like, I dream of that. <laughs> Brothers especially, right? Or they, want, they want that same wedding as well. <laughs> They're wondering where they can turn the channel to, to the football game. Yeah. But we look at that and go, wow, that's something to treasure. That's beautiful. And yet, you are. You are that. You are a son of God. A son of the king. You are a, a daughter of God. A daughter of the king. You're a prince. You're a princess. And so you've got to ask yourself, 
do we carry ourselves? Do we know who you are? When you have confidence in who you are, it gives you a different swagger. Right? It gives you a, a, a different authority, a different confidence. And so that way, we understand who God is. We have confidence that we can go before him. Growing up, I guarantee when we were little, little, we had full, full confidence going to our families. Full confidence to go to our mom, to our dad, to mom, dad, I deserve a bicycle. <laughs> right? I need an ice cream cone right now. <laughs> like, stat. <laughs> wow, we have confidence. To approach our mom, to approach our dad, to say, dad, I need this. And I know you're the one that can make this happen. Right? In the same way, now as sons and daughters, we can start to go, oh, I don't want to bother God. I mean, who am I? I don't deserve this. Could you imagine, like, like your child doing that to you? You know, I don't deserve I don't deserve this. I'm a loser. What am I doing with my life? I mean, you know, I probably would love you, really. You're like, you're three. <laughs> you should be comprehending any of these things. You should just be like, blue skies and rainbows. What? What? And yet, that's how God treasures us. And we can treat him that same way with a lack of confidence. Why? Because we don't know who we are. God's word, yes, it's the Bible, amen? amen. But God's word as well, what helps us, it's God speaking to us. Yeah. When we're affirmed by others, we're encouraged. God's word affirms our faith. It affirms our identity. It affirms who we are so that we can have great confidence. Look over in Isaiah chapter 49. Keep, keep your finger there in Luke chapter 4. In Isaiah chapter 49, this is one of my favorite scriptures. Because even though I've been a disciple for 11 years, or, or you know, I'm an evangelist, I lead the church, I, you know, all these things, blah, blah, blah. Like, like I can't get my confidence that, and even I can start to question, like, am I really a great man of God? Can I really do this? I don't know. I mean, I've seen in my life, I've seen divorce, I've seen challenges, I've seen so many people quit, uh, people that have committed suicide. Man, I don't know. And yet, when I go to God, then I know. Yeah. Who I am. Verse, verse uh, 15 in Isaiah 49. The Bible says, Can a mother forget the baby at her breast? And have no compassion on the child she has born? Though she may forget, I will not forget you. See, I have engraved you on the palm of my hands. Your walls are ever before me. We stop. Isn't that cool? Yeah. Like, like, we might have had family or friends who, who have abandoned us. People who have like, oh, God has never let go. And then it says, you're so awesome. Like, I've, I've engraved you on the palm of my hand. It's like, you're ever before me. It's like, wow. You know how we can kind of take our phones like this? <laughs> if you take it away, there's a bomb. Oh, so, so like, <laughs> I know, but you have that? <laughs> and it's just in the same way, like, like, that's how God views it. You can spend a lot of time looking at your screen. God spends a lot of time just looking at you. He's like, oh, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And what is he looking at? He's not looking at Facebook. He's not looking at ESPN. He's not looking at, you know, Instagram. He's looking at you. He's looking at me. And he says, wow, I love you. You're never before me. I've never forgotten you. I've never once for one second let you know. You need to know who you are. Amen? Yeah. When we have this, we can overcome yeah. the temptations to quit. We can overcome the temptations to be famous, that we can be used by God, or God's plan for our life, or the future, whatever that might hold. See, if that's where you're at this morning, I want to challenge you to know who you are, to remember what God has chosen you to be, a son, a daughter, a prince, a princess. Amen? Amen. Let's go back to Luke chapter 4. Our second point, when you understand a king with a common touch, you also understand that God's way is greater. God's way is greater. In Luke chapter 4, we keep reading about the temptations here in verse 5. 
The Bible says the devil led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor. It has been given to me, and I can give it to anyone I want to. If you worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered, it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. We stop here. You know, when we study the Bible, and we understood we become true disciples of Jesus, yeah. we understood something, that a disciple makes disciples. Amen? Amen? A disciple makes disciples who makes disciples. Why? Because Jesus' great commission was, therefore, go and make disciples. But what challenges us, what, ch what inspires us, what convicts us, on what authority are we supposed to do this? It's Jesus. Jesus, all authority, all the kingdoms, all the splendor, and heaven and on earth have been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples. So, so what do we understand? See, Jesus could have had all of that without the cross. Jesus could have had all the splendor of the world, all the kingdoms of the world, if he would have just bowed down and taken a knee for one moment for Satan. Is that incredible? But he understood, he goes, no, God's way is greater. I think often we can want the easiest path, the quickest solution. We don't want abs in seven minutes, we want six minute abs. We want microwavable popcorn. We want the easiest degree we can get at our university. What's the least amount I have to write in this paper, professor? Do I have to stay for my whole shift, employer? We want to do the least, and yet we don't say, see, God's way is greater. This is ingrained to us. I'm that way as well. Okay, what's the least I have to do to have a good marriage? Like, what's the least I have to do to be a good leader? What's the least I have to do to be a good friend? And we start to minimalize these areas and say, no, no, God's way is greater. But God's way is more challenging because it involves the cross. You've got to ask yourself this morning, are there areas in your life where you're wanting to take a shortcut? Wow. Wow. See, every shortcut involves a submission ultimately to Satan. A compromise to God is a submission to Satan. Wow. We don't see it that way. Well, no, I'm not like as bad as that guy. Wow. I mean, look at that. I'm not as bad as that girl. In fact, I'm better than who I used to be, so isn't that good enough? Wow. And we stop measuring ourselves to the word of God. So no, worship God only. Wow. See, we've got to make sure we realize God's way is greater. Yeah. We can have everything, but everything without God is hopeless. Totally. Yep. Well, you know, well, are you sure? Yeah, we sing songs about it all the time. See, the world understands this. The world, whatever they worship, whatever they idolize, they believe their life is worth nothing without that. My life is nothing without the car. My life is nothing without the relationship. My life is nothing without my health or my, my future or whatever. But without God, of course, it's nothing. Well, how do we know that's what the world worships? Well, a lot of us, we love the song by Alicia Keys. You know, I got nothing without you. But some people want it all. I don't want it at all. It ain't you, babe, right? Some people want diamond rings, some just want everything. But everything means nothing without you. Everything means nothing without you, babe. Amen? Everything means nothing without God. You see, our marriages will not work without God. Our lives will not work without God. We tried that. And it didn't work. You tried it your way, and now it's time to try it Yahweh. Amen? God's way is greater. You in here, church? Amen. Lastly here, we look at verse 9. The Bible says, The devil led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, Throw yourself down from here, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They will lift you up in their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. Jesus answered, It is said, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished all this tempting, he left them until an opportune time. Stop here. I bet you that kind of like, well, 
like a tingle up my spine right there, like a little shiver. Wow. Like, Satan was done, but he wasn't done. Right? He was like, okay. I'll be back later. Wow. And yet Jesus was able to pass the test. That's our last point. Pass the test. Pass the test. I think something quickly here we can see. Satan finally realized that it was, okay, oh Jesus, I see what you do here. Every time I try to tempt you, you bring up the word. Okay. I got one for you. Doesn't the Bible say? Okay. Throw yourself down, God will protect you. So why don't you do it? And Jesus goes, no, no, no. You, you, yes, you know the word God, but I am the word. <laughs> don't, don't put God to the test. It's incredible. You see, many times we, we try to fight the battle against our sin, ultimately against Satan with the wrong weapons. Satan knows the Bible better than you. Satan knows the Bible better than me. Our combined knowledge is like a, a, a drop in the bucket compared to how well Satan knows the scriptures. And so we've got to be those that we have deep conviction. That's how you pass the test. Because when you understand God in that way, you can never fully understand God, but when you understand God's word, everything, quote unquote, makes sense, even when it doesn't make sense. You with me, your church? Yeah. That when you're going through hardships and trials of life, you go, God, why are you doing this? This doesn't make sense. And then we look at the scriptures and go, yep, that makes sense. I trust God. I trust God. I am putting my life into his hands that no matter what happens, I'm willing to endure what's happening because I want to pass the test. Right. Well, if we're going to pass this test here, guys, I think we got to have a, a little bit of a study guide. Mm -hmm. Amen? And one of the misconceptions from the scriptures is about being tempted by God mm -hmm. and what God will allow us to go through. And so let's, let's kind of fix that here as we close on out here. Look over in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, down to verse 12, the Bible says, So if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to man. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. This, this is pretty complex right here. The Bible doesn't say God will give you more than you can handle. That's not what it says. The Bible says right here, God is going to allow you to be tempted. But he's never going to let you be tempted beyond what you can handle. Isn't that incredible? And yet what he says, the solution is that he doesn't magically just take it away. Oh, he says, you're going to have to endure through it. But he's going to give you a way to stand up under, to carry that burden and get out of that situation. Because many times, I don't much when I'm tempted to sin, it's like there's a weight on me and I can't get out of it. Like, I'm like, I'm stuck in this. And, and I'm angry, and I'm mad, and I'm upset, and I'm bitter, and I want to turn to impurity. I want to get angry. I want to be selfish. I want to be prideful. I want to quit. It's like, well, like all of a sudden you feel like you can't move from that place. God's like, you're going to have to endure through it, but I'm going to give you a way out. Yeah. The question isn't, does God give us a way out? The question is, are we looking for it in those situations? Wow. That's why we turn to fear, and it, and it just totally, totally paralyzes us. We've already made the decision there is no option. To make a decision that there is no option is to say that you are the victim. Because a victim has no option. A victim has no alternative. And when we start to victimize ourselves, instead of saying Jesus is the victim, we start to limit what God can do. God, there is no option. I've already decided this is hopeless. There is no option. That's why I have to do this. And so, wait, God, you're, you're going to give me a better way. And I know I'm going to have to endure through this. But I know that you'll get me through it. Look over in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Yeah. We get a better understanding. Okay. So to pass the test, you've got to know the scriptures. So we'll have a pop quiz next Sunday. So. <laughs> it's going to be comprehensive on the whole Bible. So, you know. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. 
Verse 8. It says, We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about the troubles we experienced in the province of Asia. We were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt we received the sentence of death. But this happened, that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God, who raises the dead. We've got to change our spiritual conviction. God does give you more than you can handle. Absolutely. Far beyond your ability to endure. To the point where these men of God, they wanted to die. Like, I would rather be dead than go through this. You guys ever felt that way before? Sometimes spiritually you feel that way? I would rather just die spiritually right now than have to go through this. I'd rather die spiritually than have to reconcile this relationship with this brother or sister that sinned against me or I sinned against. I'd rather die spiritually than have to sacrifice for God through special missions. I'd rather die spiritually than have to raise up and become a leader and take on more responsibility. I'd rather die spiritually than have to continue to live the life of a single. I'd rather die spiritually than have to be in this situation in my life. And yet, you don't realize that was put there by God to pass the test. You see, we're given many tests in life, but the ultimate is our relationship with God. To die faithfully. You with me, guys? No matter where you're at, it doesn't matter. You can start to study again to pass the test. And the ultimate test is to die faithful, to stand before God with confidence, knowing that you are a prince, you are a princess. And so you have confidence, you find mercy, to have that eternal relationship with the Lord. You get your church? Amen. If you're studying the Bible, it's time, you know the study guide, it's time to pass the test and get baptized. Amen? Amen. If you walked away from God, if you've pushed him away, it's time to bring him in again, to be restored in your relationship with the Lord so you can pass the test. You know, for all of us this morning, we've got to have that mindset. That we serve a king with a common touch. That we serve a king who's not distant, we never get to be close to, but who wants to be near to you. Who yeah. wants to intercede for you. Who's willing to do whatever it takes. But you got to know who you are. God is not looking at his phone. He's looking at you. Yeah. He's engraved you on the palm of his hand. That you got to understand, your way is probably pretty cool. Your way probably can, can have some success to it, I'm sure, but God's way is greater. Yeah, yeah. To not submit to Satan, but to give into what God desires because God's way is greater. And lastly, for us to pass the test. The test of the, the, the uncertainties of the future, the test and the trials of our heart and our life, and the test of one day stand before God and say, Jesus, you truly have been Lord of my life, and I want to be with you for all of eternity. Come on. Let's worship the king with a common touch. And to God be the glory. Thank you so much. Yeah.